One, two, a bit of a delay. One, two. That gets annoying, we might turn it off. Oh, it's got a bit, bit of a delay going on. So. I like that, it makes me feel like I'm in a stadium. <laughs> Good evening, Wembley. <laughs> Well, I hope it lives up to your. Anyone who's learning about recursion at the moment. I think so. Yep. Ask me in 20 minutes. Can you put the more attractive people on the front row?
I'm very comfortable for the OC. Like, really comfortable. I know. That's right. You can respond to the bravest person in the room. And that's a title worth having. Yes. Um, welcome, everybody. Hi. Welcome to the second uh, functional program for the Beta. Um, we're a bit low on numbers. I think it's because of some the trends. Some chaos in Hoban. There's that's going to have to, like, no, I'm testing. And there really? Mm -hmm. Is that what it's an anti Uber thing? Yeah, it's just gridlock yeah. everywhere. Uber's going to die, right? <laughs> <laughs> TFL against it as well. This is happening. Um, thanks for coming. Um, there's lots of food. So, um, right. There's lots and lots of food. So, you know, when you get hungry again, just go out and get another one. <laughs> um, and there's loads more food as well. So, um, welcome. We've got three great speakers tonight. Chris is going to do the first talk about Elm, and then Christian's going to talk about uh, the school over there, and then Sunny's going to do. Uh, next generation web or when I'm also web to the future or not the future. Tomorrow web. Tomorrow's web. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so let's get going, I think. And um very casual just go up and get the boots up the pizza, burgers, and everything else here. Thank you very much. Hello. Um uh, an asynchronous function walks into a pub. <laughs> the bartender says, what can I get you, sir? So I'm going to talk about Elm for real work. And um, the asynchronous function says I'll have a pint of beer. <laughs> and the bartender says, certainly, sir. Anything else? Um, Elm for real work. Why? Why is Elm pressing? Complexity. That's my opening thought. I want to tell, give you my definition of complexity. Uh, there are a few good ones lying around. But mine is this. The complexity of a system is defined by the number of decisions it encodes. The more decisions a piece of software has, has encoded from discussions in the company, the more complex that software. I think front-end work is incredibly complex. It pretty much has to mirror all your back-end work in some way, shape, or form. Plus, it has to have nice errors. You can't throw a stack trace in the front end. Plus, the most complicated source of input in the world, you've got users. Plus, the second most complicated source of input in the world, the marketing team. And then everyone else. When you're on the front end, everyone in the company has an opinion on what you're doing. When you're in the back end, nobody cares about you until it's broken. I've worked in both tiers, so I can say this. And the front end is constantly in flux. There's a constant flow of people saying, our sign-ups have dropped. We need to rework everything. Um, front end stuff is incredibly complicated. And it's, it, it's a different kind of hard to distribute to databases. But it's one of the two big kind of hard kinds of hard we face at work. Um, they're also incredibly important. Your user interface can make or break the company because your users may not even get to the point where they're using the features that you've spent months diligently building if the initial experience isn't good. We need really, really high quality stuff here. Or a startup can easily fall just trying to get the UI right. Which is a shame because we've got the worst tools of the whole of programming. Uh, we're, in, we're in dire straits. Um, the expectations of what a website should look like is vastly outstripping what we can, the speed of evolution of JavaScript. Um, we are running to catch up, and that running is not proving fast enough anymore. Plus, most of our solutions, sadly, in JavaScript land are workarounds. Take something fantastic like uh, an immutable data structures library, which is a great thing, um, which gives you which removes the side effects from a vast portion of your system. But it's still a workaround, because you can still have mutable data everywhere. It's, it's a discipline to use it. Every time, we, and my point there is, every time we add something good, 
we don't take away the crud. It's a fundamental problem with JavaScript. You can add all these great things and you still got all the crap. There is a pre pressing case for something vastly better. Elm. <laughs> Elm is one of three very interesting options you'll see tonight. Um, I've used them all. I particularly like Elm for reasons I'm going to go into. But the other two tonight have my full support too. We are way ahead of where JavaScript is. I don't mean that arrogantly. I mean that with a desperate need for something better and hope that we may be finding it as an industry. Uh, Elm is a variant of Haskell. It's written in Haskell. It compiles to JavaScript. It's easy to learn. I will make you a bet that you can learn how to write a whole app in Elm before you can really learn how Angular directives work. <laughs> so, it's pretty much true of most topics, isn't it? Um, and it's also structurally very simple, and I'm going to go into why that, how, what I mean by that. Um, it's got a friendly static typing system. It's friendly in that it's, it's um, fairly accessible. It, someone had this great quote about Java, that Java's type system has a maximum of cer ceremony with a minimum of safety. And um, Elm is the opposite of that. Um, it's got cool things like that are coming to the fore in JavaScript programming, like uh, pure rendering that you see in React and virtual DOM. It's got one-way data flow, another idea being popularized by Facebook. Immutable data structures, which deal with a vast source of side effects in your code. Pure functions, um, and a real emphasis on getting control over side effects, eliminating the ones that you can eliminate, and managing very tightly in the language the ones you can't. I think that's very important. So, that's enough why. Let's have a look at some actual code. I would like to tell you about Elm's app structure and why it's important. I'd like to give you some examples for some real apps I've built, because I think there's a bit of a myth that Elm's only for game programming. It's actually incredibly useful for bread and butter, I've got forms and crud type stuff. You can really get real work done in Elm. And I think I can say that more of Elm than any other solution for the front end at the moment. You can really ship in it. And then if there's time, demos and QA. Do interrupt me with questions if you've got any along the way, by the way. So Elm architecture basically breaks down into four things. What's the state of the world? Right? What, what things do we have to remember to actually produce this user interface? How do we show it? How do you turn the state of the world into HTML? What stuff can happen? Because stuff happens. Um, life would be a lot easier if it didn't, but users are going to want to do stuff. And when stuff happens, what do we do? Who cares? What's the point? Let me show you each of those four pieces. There really are only four in an LMAP. So can you see that OK? Is that large enough? Should I make that, uh, bit, make, I'll make that a bit larger? At a certain point, the cursor size just gets larger, and that's not very useful. Um, so here's an example of what I mean by what's the state of the world. Um, imagine we're just building a login form. So we need to remember what username someone's typing in, what password. Probably we need to retain the last error, if there is any, because maybe you've submitted the wrong password, and we've got to show you your password is incorrect. And we may have actually successfully logged in, so we'll store the credentials. That would be an example of a, the model for a login module. right? That's piece one. Second piece, what can happen? Well, someone can submit the form, so we'll describe that with a type. Um, someone could change the username, we type it into the form, and that would give us a new username. Equally, someone could change the password, and that would give us another string. So all these events, these are all, they're called actions in Elm, but they're like events, and all these events can have a payload. So submit is just an event with no payload. Change username has a payload of the username that's changing. And then the last event we can have is you get a login response from the server. So we're going to go to the server, we're going to send the username and password, something comes back, it might be an error or it might be our authentication token, which we can use from now on. Um, if you're familiar with, can I just have a quick show of hands? Who's familiar with Haskell? Okay. So for the Haskell people, result is an either. Um, for everyone else, you can have either of those things. <laughs> Um, okay, 
So what's the state of the world? What can happen? What do we do when something happens? That's the next question. When you've got the state of the world and an event comes in, how does the state of the world change? So for instance, uh, we'll have this, every LMAP will have a function probably called update that says if I get an action and a model, this is what I do. If the action is change username, then I'm just going to go into the model and update the username field with whatever the payload of the action was. Yeah, That's pretty vanilla stuff. Hopefully everyone can sort of read that even if they're not familiar with the syntax. We're just updating the record. Um, we also need to be able to do one other thing. Um, when an action comes in, we need to be able to trigger uh, side effects. We have to trigger side effects, but we can control them very tightly in L. So one thing we might do is have the side effect of launch an AJAX request. In this case, we're going to take the model of the world. We're going to have a function that says, if you give me the model of the world, I can encode that as form parameters. I can send it to this endpoint, auth login, as a post. And I will explain what decode auth token means. Uh, it's basically a JSON parser. I'm going to go into JSON parsers in a minute. Wrap that all up as a package such that if I give you a model, you can give me the side effect, send this off to the server, and parse the response. Now that we know effects, um, now we know, does anyone want to, is everyone happy with that idea? I hope. I'm going to carry on unless anyone asks questions. So I lied, actually. I lied about what an update function is. It's, it doesn't take an action in the model, return a new action. It takes an action in the model and returns a new model and possibly some side effects. So the actual description for change username is update the username with the string and do no side effects. Okay. We need to make that change so that we can actually submit the form. When the user says, submit this form, we will do two things. We're going to update the model to say that we're loading, so that's going to block it out in the UI. And we're going to say the last submission error is nothing now. Whatever it was, we're throwing it away because we're trying again. And then this recipe will actually trigger the side effect of go to the server. And we're going to wrap it up. So whatever the response is, we wrap that up as an action. Uh, which we're going to call login response, and I'll show you how we handle that. It's not too wild. If a login response comes back with, okay, that succeeded, here's a token, we stop loading, the last error is nothing, and we store those credentials. And there are no side effects. If there was an error, we stop loading, we store the error, we don't store any credentials. And there are no side effects. Just is, um, so there are no kind of null pointer exceptions in Elm. So you've got to have a way of saying this thing might exist or it might not. You know, you can have, you can have a string, uh, but it, uh, in the case of the last error, you might have an error or you might not, right? So, I, so you've got this um, optional maybe type, which says this thing can either be a value or it might be nil. And if it's nil, we, we say nothing is the type. If it's actually something, we have to wrap it up for the type system to be able to check it. So we just wrap it in a container that says, actually, we do have something. And that's what just is. It's something that wraps the error in a, actually, we have something. Yeah? So that's three pieces. And I will recap these. The fourth is rendering. And this is actually pretty straightforward. Ideally, rendering would look like this. We take the model and we produce HTML. And even if you don't read that, pretend I've just introduced a new JavaScript templating library, and it shouldn't look too wild. Except this one's checked at compile time, which is nice. So this is describing a form with two inputs and a submit button. Every piece in there every function in there. Um, the form takes two arguments, a list of attributes and a list of children. Input, list of attributes, list of children. Button, list of attributes, list of children. I think the interesting one there is disabled. So we know that if, um, 
Have I got that the wrong way around? Um, oh yeah. So if um, if model.username is an empty string or model.password is an empty string, then we disable the submit button, right? This is just a pure function. It transforms data into HTML, which is a concept you will have seen in React if you're up to speed with that. Um, that would be an ideal world. Unfortunately, it is a bit more complicated than that because of the DOM. Really, because we have to be able to it's not enough for a, U, for a UI renderer to say, here's HTML. We have to be able to supply hooks to the user that say that allow them to send new events, new actions. Um, and Elm models this with a, an address, which is sort of like a mailbox, a place that you can send new actions. Uh, the UI code can't call programs. It can't run programs. You can't get a snippet of model changing code inside an event handler, which is an abomination. All the user interface is allowed to do is present stuff to the user and allow them to, to send new data packets of actions. So someone can click uh, the button and it will send a submit action. You can see that at the bottom. And that is all four pieces of Elm's architecture. And that is how, for no apparent reason, it goes blank. Ah, B for blank. I've learned something. Um, let me recap that because it's a lot to take in. The Elm architecture is, we've got a state of the world. Right? We, we have some way of describing what we have to remember for this module. We have the means to show it and the means for the user to send us back new events because they will click on stuff. Stuff happens. We model that with a type. And then once stuff happens, what does it mean? And that is the whole of Elm pretty much. You know, there, are, there are details of syntax and library functions to work out, but that is what any L map will look like. Those four pieces. Um, any questions on that before I have a quick rant? No, we want you to skip to the rant. That sounds great. <laughs> um, the nice thing about Elm's architecture, and somewhere the MVC goes wrong, uh, see if I can think of an example without picking on an easy target like Angular. No, I'm going to pick on Angular. Um, in a sane world, when you render HTML, you would take some data and you would turn it into HTML. And that would be your job done. And that would be a pure function and you could test it and you could make, you could reason about it and you could rely on it. Um, and that's supposed to be the idea of MVC, right? You have data, you have a controller, and it takes the data and spits it out to the user. And both MV, you know, Trad MVC and Elm have these concepts. The big difference where MVC goes wrong is in combination. When you have a series of modules in MVC, you take your view and you embed a component that has its own state. Right, so you, you have a main page and you embed a login component, and now the view code has to rely on this stateful thing which ties up model view and controller itself. Which means, in effect, every single view of any interest is stateful because it embeds something stateful. Whereas the right way to combine it is to combine the pieces and then glue them all together at the top. So every every component's view you rely on should be glued in. When you when you take a main page and you take a login page, you should glue their view into your view, their model into your model, and their controller into your controller. And you end up with a pure view, a pure model, and a pure controller. And that keeps you sane because it keeps you functional. And then you just do one gluing of the three at the top. You can um, equally in Elm. I don't have an example of this, but that glues together the effects. So you're up. So you end up with one master update function, which takes a master model and a master action type, processes them over, and gets a master new model and a master new set of effects. You you manage to retain the modularity of each component, but you're not making each parent impure. I hope I've explained that. 
Um, save it for questions at the end. That's, that's the big idea. There are four things that describe every app, and they are combined separately until you reach the top, so that no one type of thing pollutes the other types of things. So when you render a view, it genuinely is a pure function. When you, when you have a model, it gen genuinely is the complete state of the app, even though you're nesting children. And that is very, very nice. Right, that's very abstract. I'm going to go on to some more um, real-world stuff. Parsing. Here's an example of um, a bread-and-butter task you need to do in Elm. Parsing JSON, because it's a typed language, you can't just dynamically reflect on it. You have to, you have to be able to say, I've got some JSON in, and this is how I'm going to turn it into, type, into typed data. Here's a good example. This is a geocoding API. Uh, I sent it, I think I sent it Royal Festival Hall London and got this response back. So I'd like to turn this into typed stuff in Elm. This is code from a hack that I did a few weeks ago. So we'll define a place as being an address, a latitude, and longitude, right? It's just the data structure. Then how do we make a JSON decoder for a list of places? We just look in the candidate key and say that will contain a list of things you can decode with this function, decode place. You just nest the, decode, the um, JSON decoders. Just show you that again. So it's a top level key candidates, and that contains a list of interesting things, right? And then this one's a bit more interesting. To decode a single place, you can pretty much read that, can't you? Um, you look you look under the address key, and you'll find a string there, or the parser will return an error. And you then for the next field, you look under location, and then under that x, and you get a float. Then the next key is under location and a y, and you get another float. So that's a good example of top level keys and then this nested path thing. And that's all there is to a JSON decoder. Um, you are done. I was um, writing this code at a hack day. I'm going to ramble. How am I doing for time? Because I'm a bit worried about. Yeah. You, you can throw things at no, you can throw things at me. The rest of you can't. If I'm getting close to time, <coughs> I was um, writing this code at a hack day a couple of weeks ago, um, and I thought at the time that it might slow slow me down having to write individual decoders from my JSON stuff. The truth is, it actually sp sped me up a lot because there's not much code to a JSON decoder in Elm. But my first assumptions about what the API would return, which fields happened when, which fields are reliable, which fields are always present, and which suddenly disappeared depending on what type of results you got. Um, those assumptions were gradually eroded as the day went on. And every time I found there was a mistake in my assumptions, I got a parser error, I changed the parser, and the compiler tells me all the list of places in my code that need to change before the system will run reliably. When I changed that shopping list, the code worked again which is vastly faster than hunting down type of undefined is not a function everywhere. Hands up if you've seen type of undefined is not a function this week. Yeah, OK. Um, so yeah, my point there is it's easy, and it would seem like a lot of work, but it actually isn't, and it saves you time. Um, if I may say something. Champions Elm, on that hack day, I think there were 10 teams and only two finished their app, and only one had one person doing the coding, <laughs> um, which I attribute to better tools. I really do. And great hair. Reasonable. Um, OK, here's another real-world example of uh, an app I've been working on. Analytics. Analytics is quite interesting because um, I don't know if you've ever had this conversation. I've had this a few times where the marketing department comes in and says, we need event tracking on the app. And the coders say, which events do you want to track? And they say, all of them. Mm -hmm. And you suck your teeth. Because it means putting an event tracking handler in so many places over the app. And you know you'll never remember them all. You know six months from now there'll be things you don't track and someone will come in screaming. Um, 
all this kind of stuff. It's really easy in event-based systems. Um, of you know, Elm's not the only one, but when you when you have this list of events coming in, tracking them is just child play. You define um, a thing you need. Uh, you define a type of thing you need to send to Google. I've missed out a couple of fields deliberately for anyone who really knows the API because I run out of space on slides. And then you just say, okay, I need a way to turn my stream of actions. I need a function that can take any action and tell me if I've got an analytics event from that. So I just define in one place all my um, all my analytics a actions that can happen. And it's isolated in one place, and it's easy to maintain, and it's easy to read. And coming soon in the Elm compiler, it will tell you if you've missed any out. So no, no event left behind. <laughs> Um, so in the case of this app, uh, you can click on a product. There are a couple of buttons on every product, and the product has a unique ID. And if you click to buy it, we're going to track that. Um, this is where I ran out of space on the slides. The fourth field is label. <laughs> Sorry, the third field in uh, analytics event is label, and we'd use the ID. Uh, and if you share it on Twitter, we use that ID as well. So we get this all in the back in the Google Analytics back end. In the future, be able to look at the type action, look at all the things you've defined as actions, and if one of those is missing from there, the product can tell them. Yeah, yeah, which is really cool. It means, um, you know, every time you add a new action, you'll get this shopping list of things you need to do to bring the app up to speed. Um, that's actually committed in the master, but it's waiting <coughs> on the next release. And I think when that comes in, the only runtime errors I get on any of my own apps will be reduced down to JavaScript interrupt. Everything else is called a compile time, which is awesome. Um, and then I thought I'd just quickly show you the wiring. So this turns an, an action into an analytics type, which uh, is a maybe, so it might not bother. It might say nothing. We don't track everything. Then this code turns an action into the side effect, um, actually send this to Google. And it will come back wrapped in an analytic sent event, which is just an acknowledgement. We'll handle that by not really doing anything. But it has to be wrapped in an, in an effect. And then we see how my slides have broken in an exciting way. Um, uh, oh, I've missed an end tag. Shout out to anyone who does their slides in Emacs. Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> right. Has it gone small again? Yeah. Um, and then this is a wrapper around our update function. So this just says, it's got exactly the same type as the update function. And we're going to say, for any time we get an action and model in, call update on it, we'll get the new model and any side effects. And then we're just going to batch that in with, turn it into an analytics effect. So we're just wrapping the update function with whatever that update function does, add in an analytics side effect as well. And then um, I'm not going to go into interrupt because I know I don't have time for that. But this is what it looks like under the hood. The little bit of code that glues, there's a side effect of send something to Google, which has to be in JavaScript land. And this is what it looks like. It's not. It didn't take me long to write. Um, it was the main source of runtime errors until I got it right. And then that's completely reliable. Yeah. <laughs> um. Oh, that was where the missing tag was. Let me just. You know you won't see me regenerate my slides in real time, don't you? There we go. That is. Have we got time for a few demos of some real world Elm stuff? Sure. Do we want to see some? Yeah. Do we want to see some? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just um, so that, that hopefully gives you a flavour of what it's like under the hood. Um, as I said, there is a bit of a myth that it's only good for um, games or toy apps. So I'll show you some real stuff. Yeah, yeah, sure. Look at Elm, and it seemed like at the time we looked at it, it was Elm HTML, and there was another way of doing the view as well. 
Yeah. And some of the examples you read were in the old way, which I'm guessing is the old way, and some were in the old HTML way. What's what's the deal with that? Are they moving from one to the other, or is both? No, I think both are definitely going to be supported going forward. Um, the one was more suited to like Canvas type stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the um, the the graphics library. The, the, I mean, Elm started out with everything is broken. Let's redo everything, right? Including let's do, redo rendering, let's redo HTML, let's redo a CSS. That's very interesting stuff. I haven't really looked at it. Um, I've really only used Elm for. I want a much much better Angular or JavaScript with React or thing. So I pretty much went straight to render HTML. Um, let's see. So, demos. Let's have a look at this one first because it's quick and fun. No, let's not because it will ruin my other point. Let's have a look at this one. There we go. So, um, this is the currently live version of the startup I'm working on, which is where I got that logging code from earlier. It's remembered my username and password, which is good because I can't. But this is exactly the code I showed you earlier. So there's a login form. You submit. You might see it disables temporarily while it goes to the server and gets my auth token. Now, this is a huge screen, obviously, but this is Elm interoperating with Google Maps. As I scroll around, places of interest pop up. This table will update in real time. This is quite an early prototype that's on the web. I can filter stuff. Um, and I can get debugging, which is quite useful. You see the latitude and longitude of the frame move. And uh, if I go out, I get a heat map. This is, again, this is one of the things where it's almost all Elm. There's a tiny bit of interrupt because I don't want to rewrite Google Maps in Elm. Uh, and Google Maps has been my largest source of bugs. Not to say, you know, the dealing with Google Maps, the API of, rather than the code itself. Um, and this is a hobby site of mine. You probably can't tell from what I'm wearing, but I quite like tailoring as a hobby. And um, all the tailoring and uh, sewing pattern websites are basically 10-year-old PHP pieces of rubbish. So I knocked up something that would at least give me kind of infinite scroll browsing of the world's um, sewing patterns. So you can go in, you can search by category. Um, if you look for the scroll bar on the right, you can probably see infinite scrolling in. Um, it has the analytic stuff I showed you earlier. Uh, you can save stuff, and that gives you a list of your favorite patterns. Um, and that is interoperating with local storage because it saves it locally on your browser. Um, it's all made a great deal easier by um, by Elm. I mean, the, the the stuff for interop is way for thin on that. But this is, I hope, you will forgive my graphic design skills, and agree that this could easily be an agency website. Um, this is the kind of thing that someone would come to you and build and would be vastly easier to build than in Angular, which would be a standard choice for an agency. Um, I'll show you the thing quickly from the hack day I went to. Um, this is a day's worth of coding. So a friend of mine had the idea that it would be fun if you could have a device when you're cycling around London that instead of telling you exactly where to go, it would just be this heads-up display that would tell you, if you can see that, it would tell you which direction you need to go and how far you need to go. And it would be your job as a cyclist to weave your way around until this magic compass said you're there. It would be a more fun and less, um, less constrained way of cycling around London. You wouldn't have to stop and take your phone out. So I thought that was quite a nice idea. I hacked it up. Um, here, Anyone know the address here? Let's see if we can find it. Postcode? Yeah. Uh, AC1Y8RQ. 8RQ. This is going off to a geocoding API. Um, <coughs> is it going to find anything? 
Uh, yeah. Actual error display. Could have made that sweeter. I only had a hack day. Um, oh. I wonder if they've blocked the API since the hack day. They're expecting me to pay. Ah, oh, never mind. <laughs> What's working? I promise. Um, oh, and I'll show you this just quickly because I spoke to a couple of people earlier who had seen it already. And that's quite fun. We did this in 90 minutes worth of Elm. Luna Lander, which kind of includes the point that you can use Elm for games. Yay! Oh, I lost my point. Ah, I crashed. Ask you about the tool. Is it using NPM or Oh, um, so uh, it comes with its own compiler, which is pretty nice. Uh, in the the Hack Night, you can you can just say, "Here's my top level Elm file. Compile this into an HTML file, and it will compile the JavaScript and include it in a template thing. So you can very very quickly get started. You just open that file in your browser." Um, most of the projects I do, I just call that same compiler, get it to output JavaScript because I want a bit of control over the HTML, the framework around it. Um, so the compiler I just call using make, actually. Just old school. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll give you an example, maybe. Um, So where can I show you? There we go. That's oh oh that's much smaller on there than it is on here. There we go. Grow grow grow. So yeah, that's the um, compile this top level file. Give me warnings if you need to download anything. Do it. Um, other than that, I'm pre-compiling less with less C. But the tooling's pretty. Um, that would be exactly the same call, but you'd be calling a different top-level Elm file. So you just call Elm make on test slash main dot Elm, and you get uh, an HTML file that you run through um, Phantom. Um, the compiler's very fast. It makes it easy to get started with. Um, it does things like some dead code analysis and dead import analysis. Uh, one of the things I could never figure out of single source truth systems is how do you handle transient state? Like things like uh, animations or hover state or drag and drop kind of thing. Is it does it all go actually through the uh, the main signal? Yeah, so you just have um you'd model that as a separate data type and you'd have that as a subtype on whatever the parent view was, which would be a subtype. You just end up with this hierarchy of models, a separate hierarchy of views and then a hierarchy of actions, and it just filters the update function down. So you say, you, you might have an action that says, I am a, what's a good example? Um, I am a list of products uh, action. I'll handle that to, I'll hand that down to the function that takes a list of products model and a list of products action and gives me a new list of products model. And that actually farms it down to, I'll hand that event down to, I've got a new animation event um, and a new animation model and gets a new one, updates, and it updates all the way up. It's very hard to do on a whiteboard with hands, but hopefully you follow that. Yeah. So it's just nesting, but you're nesting each type of thing separately. How is Elm's uh, performance in browser? Really, really good. Um, I don't have the um, I don't have the benchmarks, but there is. A, if you go and look for it, you can find the be benchmarks um, pretty easily online. Is it on mobile? Um, I haven't checked mobile. I know broadly it beats React, which is pretty fast, which knocks other frameworks. I mean, React knocks other frameworks into a cocked hat. Um, it works a bit faster than ARM if you're using ClojureScript. Um, I have had performance prob some performance problems with um, closure script in production. I never have without anecdotally. It's good, is the short answer. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs>
Uh, what's the Elm language stability right now? It's been changing a lot over the years. The, the frameworks and the recommended architecture has been changing a fair bit, um, but the language hasn't changed that much. Um, most of the new kind of compiler features are things like um, things like uh, better runtime safety. I suppose a big breaking change recently was this will probably only apply to the Haskell people, but take the head of a list, and that should return a maybe of item because otherwise you'd get a runtime exception if it's an empty list, right? So they recently changed that core function, so it always returns a maybe. Um, that's an example of a pretty large breaking change in Elm terms. Um, and of course, because of the type checker, it's pretty easy to track down all the places it applies. Uh, to add to that, they improved the errors quite a bit. They were, yeah. Uh, I, maybe, uh, maybe I should. Should I show you an, uh, a compiler error? It really has gone, like you say, uh, recently gone to huge lengths to make the compiler errors very uh, beginner friendly. Let me see if I can find something. So, okay, that compiles. Let's break something. Let's forget to send the address where the click event goes. Loads of compile time errors. Um, yeah, there you go. So it really tries to handhold you through as I infer the types of values flowing through your program. <laughs> you know, and what it's really saying is, look, here in this file on that line, you've called on click submit. I was expecting an address of A as the argument, but you gave me an action. That's very fast compilation to give you a I struggle to think of anything that gives you a clearer target of what you're supposed to do next. Um, and certainly to catch that reliably at compile time. I mean, I'm not, I'm not static typing zealot, but it can be incredibly valuable, and it really is valuable right now. Especially, <coughs> when static typing is really valuable in very complicated systems that change fast, and that describes UIs. So if you imagine you've got a large rendering tree, do you walking down the tree to where the animation is yes. is legitimately that has changed that path. Yes. The rest um, you can just cache it with um, because it's a pure function. You can just memoize the rest where it's important. So it won't. So you so it's it's not the same as Haskell where it would be kind of implicitly memorized for you anyway. I think um, <clears throat> even though it's cached, it still has to get the data. So, so the, the question is whether you, you have to do the data that did itself. Oh, okay. The, uh, On the virtual one, because you, you mentioned a huge SVG with a very, very complex stuff. You should not have it, but something else that make that say just uh, uh, drop down generations or something else. Yeah. Would it affect, would it be a fact each other or not? I had this problem with an earlier version of JSCS, that's why I wasn't there. Okay, um, I have not hit that problem. Um, I struggle to know of anybody who has. Uh, I think that I'd have to say that's an area for research. Um, <laughs> isn't that a great answer? Um, I, but my expectation is the popular rivals would struggle in a case like that too. I mean, a lot of animation you can hop, hand off to um, CSS, right? There are a lot of classes of animation well, where you do that. Let's say that but, but the other kind, the other kind, I don't know. Okay. 
Any other questions? I'm sure I've ever run my time. <laughs> Sorry, the, oh yeah, the JSON decoder, yeah. It's not like an applicative instance. Don't express a name that they can handle the type process. So can you create a so how can how can you come up with a decode type with a map and then a file? Yes, so um it, is it fair to say in a way you're asking how does it look like I've got type classes when I don't have? Yes. Yeah. Um, the answer is there is a different version of map and apply for every type. And that's the only one I'd imported in that namespace. Um, yeah, I, if, if I could wish for two changes to Elm, the first would be the one that's coming, which is exhaustive pattern matching. Um, exhaustive pattern matching checks. And the next would be higher kind of types. That would be really nice. And I probably have to say, Elm, if you introduce Elm to a Haskell programmer, they instantly see the things that aren't Haskell. But you have to remember the current state of the art is Angular on JavaScript. And, and yeah. Yeah, I saw quite a heated debate online about that exact point. And the, well, I can't remember the guy's name, correct, but I'm seems to be saying we're not aiming for Haskell developers, we're aiming at the JavaScript developers who, you know, yeah. they don't know what our monad is, they don't know what any of these words mean, and we don't want to overwhelm them with science, we want to get them using this. How, how do we get? Where we are, Angular is just not controversial. Everyone knows that you can sort of get an Angular developer. But how do you get an Elm developer? How do you commit to a large project in Elm? I think the hardest thing for Elm is it's a very, very easy sell technologically. It's a very hard sell in terms of hiring. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to use it. But I don't know if I can convince my CEO that. Our clients, so well, uh, I'd love to speak to you when my startup's in the position to hire. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think, and I honestly think that uh, you know we've got a lot, a lot of goals to hit as a startup, but um, hiring I think would be quite easy because there are people that are desperate to use this stuff. Um, our stack is, I, I coined a stack acronym, Help. Haskell, Elm, Linux, and Postgres. And I think it is in both senses better than mean. Um, so yeah, we, we use Haskell on the back end, and we do miss things in Elm. But, and I'm hoping your presentation will prove me wrong, at the time I looked at GHCJS, I didn't think it was ready for production. Um, and Elm is, and I need to ship today. Um, how do you convince people who were technical and often got to be careful. I've been a CTO of startups, so I can say things are slightly rude about CTOs of startups. Often CTOs aren't as technical as they used to be. Um, how do you convince those people to take a risk on something that will be hard to hire for, which is their big headache? Um, small projects is usually the answer. You start small and you see that it makes a difference. And it's only worth introducing those big new changes for stuff that really makes a difference. Um, this vastly is a jump over Angular. Um, I, I thought Angular was great when it came out because it was a vast jump over jQuery and manual DOM manipulation. This is a jump ahead of that. Um, start small and show that it makes a difference. It's, I guess it you could have some kind of internal training so you can grow the Elm developers or whatever OJS developers. Yeah, I mean these things usually start with one really enthusiastic guy on the team, don't they? Um, Sorry, can I comment on that? Yeah. So uh, since we started to kind of experiment with things like Elm and PureScript, we actually find that we get a lot more, you know, smart people applying for you know, our job position. So it's not about, you know, like finding people with experience with Elm or PureScript. It's about finding like really, really, you know, good developers who are excited to work with you because you use those technologies. Yeah. So we're actually finding it has a positive hiring effect and not a negative mm -hmm. one. 
I'll tell you uh, another quick story. Um, this is a closure script story. Most of my contracting work in the past couple of years has been closure script. Um, and I was working for a company that was migrating from Angular to a closure script stack. And as soon as they did the migration to closure script, they found that because you know you separate event handling and modeling the world completely from rendering, suddenly you, the people who usually work on the back end can be shunted over to speed up front end development because they can work on the back end of the front end and they don't need any specialist HTML or CSS knowledge. They just need to know how to model data and handle events, right? So this, as soon as we started moving over to the architecture, the stuff that needed front-end specialists became much smaller, and the other people on the team could move back and forth from the front and back end as demand needed. That was a huge win that ought to excite any manager. Ought to. Any managers in the room feeling offended? <laughs> <laughs> I love you all anyway. Please hire me when my start up. No, optimism. Optimism. <laughs> way you could use it um, to add to that, not take away from that, um, is a kind of rapid prototyping. You know, if you're doing pilot projects, I mean, just thinking of agencies who have a high turnover of new applications, it would be an excellent system for prototyping, and you would soon start asking the question, why are we moving away when we start writing the real thing? Why are we not sticking with the prototyping language? Um, Right, I've talked a lot. I'm sure I've gone over my time. Um, can I just give you very quickly a list of links you might find interesting? Oh, there's me. Um, there, um, those are all the things I showed you. I've written up a couple of things on my blog about which are more detail on Elm, if you're interested, blog.jinkster.com. And there's also, which I wrote last year, so it's a little bit old now, and I need to revisit a... Um, overview of all the different types of Haskell in the browser and the state of what I thought they were in at the time. I'm looking forward to being updated on GHCJS. And I run a monthly uh, hack night in West London. Please do join us. We often have an Elm team and you can learn some more on the ground. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I feel like we like we probably all need a pee break and there's more food and there's microwaves there for me too. Should we have a five minute break and then so well, should we just go on no, break. Go on. break five minute break uh, while we're set as well.
Did it die? Yeah, it switched to uh, it comes. It just if you just go to yeah, it just show it. Again. I think maybe it's because we uh, occasionally it goes to front camera when you switch like to full screen. Yeah, uh, I think that's the reason. <laughs> You need a base text. Yeah. A what? Oh, very <laughs> good. <laughs> okay, Christian, go for it. Yeah. Uh, my name is Christian. I work for a company called uh, Whiteshire. Um, I want to layer a bit on top of what Chris said um, about Elm and other functional approaches to what we can do at the client side. Uh, the reason why I'm interested in going even further is based on the fact that all these nice properties that we can get from a language as Elm, I would like to also use that on the back end and have them communicate with each other. So the value proposition for using Haskell is the fact that you can get the same thing on the client side and the back end. Um, I will briefly introduce what we are doing at Moksha. Um, so we are a company uh, trying to, or we are making uh, energy storage units. So uh, we want to store en energy from in houses, and they can kind of um, accumulate to a lake. So the reason, the how we store energy now in Norway, for instance, is that if they have excess power, they pump that up to the top of a mountain, and when they need power at some point again, they can kind of uh, open the gates and pull them down turbines to recreate power. Um, doing this, we have uh, a quite complicated architecture where there's a lot of different things that we need to do. We have uh, the devices at home, we need to sample them. We have backend, we have lots of data going through, and we also want to present this data to our users. So, number one thing about using functional languages is maintainability. I think on my history as a developer, uh, time spent on maintaining code has been the most expensive thing ever. Um, and I see an enormous gains in productivity whenever I have done some job to a jump to something new and functional. Um, at a previous company, we had a UI that was very convoluted. Um, we changed that to use React based on the virtual DOM. Um, without thinking about it, we just wanted to make the UI more reasonable, like being able to reason about the UI, we eliminated a lot of bugs, and we didn't even focus on eliminating bugs. We just wanted to make our code better and more easier to maintain and extend. So um, Haskell has a really, really, really nice story on the back end already. Um, Haskell is mostly promoted as a, a language used for parsing, which is a, it's very good at. Hence, there are so many other languages using it as their as the base language for new language. Both PureScript and Elm is using uh, Haskell to create these uh, new languages. It has a strong, uh, as mentioned, it has a strong story for the back end, but it's also getting down the front end. So the way that Haskell works is it has a compiler called GHC, um, and it also has a back end for JavaScript now called GHCJS. So that means you can write Haskell code and compile it to JavaScript and put it down to the browser. Um, so you can utilize the power from a functional language both in the browser and the backend. Um, I want to focus a bit on the browser because um, Haskell is often regarded as something very complex or hard to understand. And there are some points in Haskell where I agree that it can be hard to wrap your head around. But I want to look at it um, in the same way that we looked at Elm so the getting an intuition with how did something look in Elm, how would it actually look in Haskell? And get an intuition, learn enough to start around playing with it as well. Um, I want to say that um, I'm not a function, fun, uh, fundamental functionalist in the sense that you should use Haskell or die. 
Uh, I believe that uh, <laughs> I believe that any language that based on sound research, um, uh, and what I mean by that is every language that is based on something that has been discovered throughout time rather than invented has the the foundation to build something great on. And using those foundations, you can learn something new, and you can lay on top of that. Um, my way of thinking like that is, for instance, like you can read, you can learn to read notes, but that doesn't necessarily make you a great piano player. Um, <laughs> it might sound weird, but I'm saying that because we, in our interest, industry today, everything is moving incredibly fast, and it's hard to keep up. There's a lot of new technologies you have to learn in order to stay relevant and also to meet your deadlines. Uh, and I often wonder why, like, what is the rush? Like, choose something you're comfortable with that is better than what you did before, and then lay on top of that. So don't be afraid. Um, just take it slowly, look at it, and then you will, pro you will progress. So at work, we are using a library called Reflex. Reflex is also implementing an FRP structure, uh, like Elm. Um, Chris didn't mention too much about it, but uh, this is the basis for what goes on in Elm. Um, and I try to, or I'm, I'm representing that as the main data structures in this library called Reflex to get an idea of what's going on. Okay, so I want to show some code to show the similarities between Elm and, and Reflex. It has a model. We have uh, the base case of the model. We have actions, two actions increment, and we have the update function. This update function look a little different. Um, it's because you can pattern match on it. I have another example where it will look exactly like Elm. You don't have to write that. Um, actually, we can rewrite it. Um, Also, I'm actually only using Sublime now as a, <laughs> a slideshow. Uh, I haven't uh, learned anything new. So, these things are equivalent. So, it looks more like them. <laughs> Sorry. This is the view. So another difference that uh, it might look a bit more complex is that you are actually having logic and the views together. Um, you can say it has some trade-off. It, it kind of relates to different points of views. So Elm is focusing on first order FRP, um, which means that the graph is static. You can't have events, streams of events, uh, whereas um, Reflex is high order FRP. But it shouldn't be too hard to watch. I like Chris's Chris example about thinking as it as another template, JavaScript template language. What we see here is a function that takes a string, which is button, and then it takes another function. And what it returns is the element, and the, the underscore denotes uh, something we don't care about. So the value of this thing is what this guy returns, but I don't care about it, so I, I signified that by the underscore. Then we make a div element. Um, and we have this guy mapped in. Um, mapped in is something that takes a function and make it work in a dynamic context. Two seconds. This is not right. Huh. 
oh, okay, this is not right. I will actually go for another example because the model here right now is not uh, is not dynamic. It's just a view. Why? Oh, it's true, based on the type, sorry. So the thing is, whenever you have something as a type, in order to act on that type, you, you, you have to interact with it in its domain, for instance. Um, and I think I want to make a side note on that. Um, um, mapped in is, is kind of a thing that will disappear in the future, um, where you can use abstraction called a functor, for instance, um, which is a type class. Um, there's two differences between Haskell, or like a big difference between Haskell and Elm is the effect on how they treat polymorphism. So, Yeah, Haskell it has parametric polymorphism and L hoc polymorphism, and Elm is only using parametric polymorphism. What this means is, uh, going back to the questions that they had before, that uh, Attila asked, was when Chris was making the JSON type, he was using map and apply and apply, and he was wondering like what that meant in the context of Elm. Since Elm is only using uh, parametricity, you have to define what some, you have to create a function that um, do what you expect for that given thing. So uh, let me write some examples. It's called map in Elm, right? Everything is called map. Okay. So in Haskell, we have something called fmap. And in Elm, they have something called map, and they also have list map, and so on. They define a map for everything individually. In Haskell, we have something called type classes. And what a type class means is that the, the thing that is going to, be, to happen is defined as an instance of that type. So a good example would be, let me let's go. Oh, uh, Chris did mention types as well. This reads as has type <coughs> of uh, in Elm is single colon and has this two colon. Okay, I'll just write this and then I will break it down. So I think one of the weird thing when you come to Haskell is you see this stuff and a lot is going on and you, you, you don't really know what to expect. Um, but it's not that different. You can't think of it in, as in terms of overloading, right? So most languages, they don't make it explicit what's going on. That's another great feature about Haskell. You have to be explicit. So if you think about JavaScript, you have the number two and the string two and you add them together, what do you get? You get 2-2 two, two as a string because of implicit uh, type coercion. Um, in, in languages like Ruby, you actually have some overloading going on that are more same defaults. So for instance, if you have a list uh, and another list, you can add them together. So add has different, or the plus sign has different meaning um, for different types in Ruby. So this is a class, it's defining something that all types that implement is an instance of this class can do this operation. We write some more. And the way that you define an instance for some type, let me write. I'm creating the uh, just example, um, like what just actually means. 
it's a data type that says you either have nothing or you have something of type A. And you can, you can see maybe A is a type constructor, which is what is signified by this. It's something that takes something in and produces a type. Star can be read as type. So F is something of type to type. <laughs> if you hang on a minute and we write that up. So we have F map. And we want to make an instance of functor for our data type, maybe. So you can see I'm not specifying all the arguments to maybe. Because it's a type constructor, it takes one argument. Is, is that clear to people? If we, so you can see our f up here is what signifies f down here. So whenever you see something like this and you go slow and just write it out, okay, then things become much more clear. And in Haskell in general, when you can get operator blinded and you, can, you, can, you think you go insane, but just slow down, take a breathe, it's actually a part of the language. The idea is think more upfront. Uh, and when you get to your destination, it's much more maintainable and more safe. So this looks arbitrary. But if we exchange the if with maybe, then it should become a bit more clear. So this means if map is something that takes a function from an A and gives me back a B. Then it takes something of maybe A and returns a maybe B. So let's implement that. So one thing to note here, uh, another thing that tripped me up when I started with Haskell, and I, I kind of uh, missed up a bit. So there is a difference between the type level and the value level. That's a very clear di distinction. So what you see on the left-hand side up here, that's type level stuff. And what you see on the right-hand side, that is value level stuff. And when you look at this stuff, right, you, you can have the idea that, hmm, is this A the same as that A? No, they're not relevant. So just to avoid confusion, let me call that X instead. So what I'm saying is f map takes in a function f and something of type maybe a. We can see the type up here. How do I construct something of maybe a? Well, I can, I can have either nothing or just a. So that means I have to define something for both cases. So in the first case, let's, this is the just case. And then I need to return something. I need to return something of maybe b. Well, how do I get to a b? Well, I have a function that takes an a to a b, and I have something that wrapped an a. So I'm just pulling that out, running the function over the thing, and putting it back in to the thing again. The intuition about this, like it might seem convoluted and strange, but the reason while doing so, if you are in some type, you should never be able to get out of it. Because doing so doesn't make any sense, right? So if you, have, if you are saying to the language that I might have a value or I might not have a value, it, it's never just there. Like it just doesn't appear later down the road. We also have to implement the other case, which is the nothing case. OK. So what does this mean? Let's test something out in order to improve our intuition. OK, we have a function plus. Um, uh, uh, everything in Haskell is a function. And another thing that's great, oh, let me increase the size of this. In Haskell, whenever you start learning and want to learn something, just go into the REPL and play around with it. There's tons of information and good stuff in there. So you can ask uh, the type of anything by saying colon t. So what is the type of plus? The plus has something from num a to a to a. 
Uh, I will get back to this. This might seem a bit uh, weird. So let's add two numbers together. I'm writing in, uh, in a list. <laughs> so this gives four. That makes sense, right? OK, but what if we had, what if we had a value that might not be there? Right, so we have to f map over it. <laughs> so so breaking this down, right, we have our f map. It takes a function. This also needs some explaining. It's, um, it's a partially applied function. So plus is normally something that took an A to A to A. Uh, actually, let me, let me make that more clear. Right. So this is something that takes an A and A and produces an A. If I partially apply that, that means I'm giving the function one argument. If you have used bind in JavaScript, or uh, use some other functional constructs. It's what's referred to as currying. So the, every function in Haskell takes one argument and returns a function that waits, waits for the other arguments. In general, in, in many, many languages, it's quite a useful feature because you can, you can reduce a lot of boilerplate by making uh, higher order functions or functions that takes more values. And then you pre-bake in some arguments to that function, and then you reuse that up in your context. So if we look at the type of this, you can see it lost one argument. So going back to this. Let's start without it. So we are we're having our normal function, a function that lives in a in our normal world. Like we can't do this. So <laughs> the the type errors in the Haskell aren't nearly as nice as an Elm, so Elm is a great, <laughs> Elm is a great place to start to, to mess around with this stuff. But we can, we can look at it. So what is this saying? Uh, it's, it's saying that it cannot find a long constraint on maybe. So it's saying that we have a type maybe A, and it's not implementing the num class. What is the num class? Well, let's ask Haskell or DHC, I. Oops. Info. Uh, T is for type, I is for info. Okay. So the num class is a class that specifies what plus means, what minus means, what multiply means, and some other functions. And you get, you get a list over some standard things where these apply. So that's why it works with numbers, because the class of num has, or int has an instance of the class num. Um, please ask questions at any time because it, it might be hard to wrap your head around. But I, I'm building up to show you some stuff where, where when this is applied, it's, it makes more sense than you should think. So we, uh, we can't add a number to something that is maybe there, like a normal number. So we had to fmap over it in order to get that to work. And then it returns the same thing right now. We have a maybe a form. Okay. Let's go to some code that is working. So I made this very simple, pointless thing just to show it off. Um, that we are running Haskell in the browser, it's working, it does something, at least, and react to values. So this is the code for that page. Again, really simple. I define a data type called route. What things can be of type routes? These are the values. And before I started this talk, I was actually uh, going into this thing. This is called the sum type. And this is the most wanted feature that I've wanted in any language that I've used um, ever. 
and it's really important that people understand that. So, for instance, if you have a function that takes a number and you do some match on that number saying like, okay, if the number is one, then do this. If the number is two, then do that. If the number is three, then do some other thing. Okay. There exists a lot of inhabitants in numbers. Well, numbers is basically infinite. So if you have a function that does something depending on a number, that can has that can have an infinite possibilities. And as Chris mentioned, that the complexity of an application is often based on how many decisions that you can have. That is simple combinatorics. I often make this example when I talk to people about like if something is complex or not. If you have five fingers, five things, how many ways can you permute them? Like how many different ways can you order five fingers? Fingers. Does anybody have an answer to that? It's 120. It's five faculty. What if you had 10? Then it's 3.6 million ish. So the complexity increased rapidly. So with something like a sum type, we can make very specific definitions of what some thing can be. So in this application, I have routes, but I can only have these routes. That means my routes are type safe. So I, I can't create a route that isn't there. I have a simple model. It looks very much like the L model. It's something that has a post ID and some content. Then I have my main model. I'm composing um, smaller models to make some bigger models that I can run through. Oh, and then I have something called input. That was called actions in L. That's bad. Let's let's change that. No, my point being, actually, <laughs> I want to show something. So huh, I made a mistake. That's annoying. It's saying on line 48 and on 45 that I don't have this thing called action. Let's go look what that is. Oh, this should be arguments. Shouldn't be a value. Then that's an action. This is an action. Let's recompile. And we're now back to green. So that worked. Now we are more Elm-ish. OK. We have a main function, a place where everything starts. And then we have our application. What does our application consist of? It consists of some streams of events. And what this is saying is we are merging those streams of events into one stream of events. So if you're familiar with uh, BaconJS or ReactJS, reactive extensions, and the multitude of other events, that's what this is doing. The reason for leftmost is that it's specifying if both events are happening on the same time, it's choosing the leftmost of those. Then we have this thing called fold dine. Um, uh, actually, I'm not aware, is uh, Elm stopped using the fold P? Uh, no. OK. So there is a thing called fold P in Elm. And basically, what fold P is saying is it's fold the past. So um, it's taking a function to update whenever some events happen. And it's taking an initial model or state, so what is our starting point. And then whenever something happens, it runs that function and presents a new state of the world. This is the exact same thing as that. Um, so you can actually represent your entire um, application as a fold. Then we are creating some markup. So this is creating the navigation menu. And it's returning its event stream, so the events that can come from my navigation. I'm creating some content. Um, the con for simplicity, I'm just passing in the entire model, even though that uh, some parts of the model might be split up, because it doesn't make sense for all subcomponents to know everything. So I'm creating a router widget, um, and I'm passing in the model. And that returns an event stream of event stream. Uh, it might be weird to have in your head, but this is basically meaning because the component can change, then the view is different, right? 
So if you're looking at a page, you have page one and page two. Page one sends events and page two sends events, but you only want to have one of them at the time. Do you have a question? I'm oh, sorry. So here's the router, how that is defined. Um, again, pretty straightforward. I'm patching on what the current route is, or pattern matching on that. So depending on what route it is, I return a function that renders that view. The navigation, it should be pretty self-explanatory as well. Um, there's one thing with Haskell that uh, also might upset people is um, operator blindness. Uh, we love operators in Haskell. Um, and, and they can be a source of a lot of confusion. But I like the idea behind Evan that he's trying to look into different ways of architecturing apps and making them more readable. So you can, you, can, you can take a lot of those learnings and just use them in Haskell to make your Haskell code much more readable for newcomers, which will help eventually. eventually. This thing is uh, ifmap constant. Um, so in order to explain that, let's look at this thing first. This guy in here, that signifies function composition in Haskell. In Elm, that would look like this. Or you could flip them around, and you could do this. So this is saying you read from right to left. Um, I'm passing this input into this function, leftmost, and then into that this function, rightmost. And then I return the events. Um, it's also important to note that return is not return as you normally think of it. Um, return in Haskell is um, is a, a function um, of the type class monad. Um, and what it is meaning is basically lifting some value into the monadic context. And all that is saying is I think we have, I think I have an example right here. Yeah, so I think the easiest way to understand this or interpret it is with lists. So So this is pretty clear how to implement that. So the function is saying like I'm I'm taking a value and I'm I'm returning a list of that value. So if I was in the list monad and wrote return four, it would give me back the list of oh, three, sorry, it will give me back the list of three. Yep. In the type signatures, like, you know what T means. Oh, that's, uh, that's a good question. So the T here is the current timeline. Um, you can have multiple timelines, but in general, you only have one. So it keeps track of how events are firing and how they should act on each other. So that's the, the context for that. So a thing about um, L hoc polymorphism is it, it can it can seem a bit noisy sometimes if you have a lot of type constraints. Um, something to be aware of. But excellent question. So this guy is equal to where constant is a function. Um, that takes an A, takes a B, and returns an A. What this is saying is you are, it's, uh, it's quite useful in many cases. Like you, you, you preload a value, and whenever that thing gets called, it, it ignores the input and just returns the value that you had in the beginning. 
So when you start out with Haskell, write everything out, use the function names, and then when you get more experience, then you can start to use these operators so they, they make more sense. Um, for me, that this seems quite clear. So we have a DOM event of click, so a click type, and what element do we have that for? We have the home now again, and then we are saying, like, whenever this is pressed, return the route input of home. Ah. So I tried whenever I get stuck in Haskell or struggle with something to do, I just I just list out the types and then I follow the types. A lot of people when coming to Haskell say like just follow the types. It looks very complex. Uh, I don't want to sketch these out here, but it's basically what we what we did in this case when we defined what fmap meant. Like if you fill in the blanks then you, you get to a point where you can actually read what's going on or what is supposed to be going on. Cool. So, that is basically it. So back on the point where you, you, Chris mentioned that he has to pass some JSON, right? He had to do that on client side. So he defined a type in, that described the shape of what that JSON looked like. Um, in Haskell, we do the same, but we can actually auto-derive that thing. So we just make a type in the language, and then we, we can derive how it should derive it. And the cool thing about using Haskell on the client side and the server is that this is the same thing. I did a talk on Elm uh, back in January where I said my dream was this exact thing. Like I wanted to be able to share constraints on the client side and the server. Like this, we normally call it wire. So you describe what is going on, what can go on. So in more complex systems, you can imagine giant files like you have request response model, what kind of request can my client send? It can request login information, users, and so on and so on. What can my server send back, or how does it respond to all of these events? You can get a complete explicit model of all the cases that you need to handle of your system, and you can keep them in sync. That is really powerful. Like, the fact that you can change the model when you're working on the back end, and suddenly your client side doesn't work anymore, that is really nice. And the other way around. Like the client expects something new, and you add that type in, and then suddenly you can't compile the backend anymore. And you, you get a pretty clear error. So Chris mentioned this about a pattern match, non-exhaustive pattern match. Uh, that basically means that you have an unhandled value. So in the case of, let's, so if, if I added some new thing here, Right. Then I would get an error in my uh, in my route pattern match because it, it's non-exhaustive. Like there's an option here that isn't accounted for. This is one of the most nicest features of running Haskell both on the client side and the server. So you're saying you share some elements of the code base between your front end code and the back end code, like yeah. these type classes or whatever you're at. Uh, something resembling this, right? Uh, so if you, you look at this, right, we have this, um, you have a channel, a channel is a client to server or server to client, like what, then you specify that. Actually, it's a, it's a good point. Think in types instead of implementation for starters, like just start writing stuff down and then figure out how to implement it after the fact. Because you can reason about this, right? Oh, I have this application. Um, well, I need to get all users, I need to subscribe this guy, I need to do these things. You just write them out one by one, and then you start implementing them. And then, like, sometimes uh, Haskell's type checker, it can be annoying, but it's the thing you have to consider is types are about um, 
I, sh I should show a burn diagram. So dynamic languages have a subset <laughs> this side, this circle. Imagine this circle. Uh, where of all the things you can do and what's valid programs in there, type programs have another subset of things you can do or can't do. The, the game of this is to be in between there, right? It, it's having meaningful programs where you can use the, you can talk to the compiler. It's not you versus the compiler. It's you and the compiler trying to figure out this program. So you specify the types, and it tells you when you're doing something wrong or where to go from there. Um, and you just sit down, write these things out, and then you start implementing, OK, this returns that. And that's, this is the number one reason for doing this, from my point of view. Um, so on the, on the, like, based on tooling, um, like some downsides, um, is interop with other ha other JavaScript libraries is a bit harder in, in Haskell than in Elm, but it's it's possible. Um, that that also means that it's a very new area, but it's really blooming uh, with the uh, with the coming of Elm and also PureScript. Um, a lot of stuff is going on in this area and also figuring out the best way of structuring UI. Um, but like you have to write some more things from scratch. But the cool thing about this is when when we have something, it's really stable and very nice to use. Uh, code size can be a problem if you're targeting something as mobile, but it's it's not too bad. Uh, and then there's one fun thing about Haskell is uh, space leaks. So um, Haskell is by definition a lazy language, and that means that a function is not evaluated before that is actually needed. And that means we can do things as uh, defining infinite things. Right. This is going from one to infinite. If I run this, it will do that. That's not very useful. But I can take four of an infinite list. I get one, two, three. Because it stops evaluating because it doesn't need anymore. So that's pretty cool, right? If I had something of some list of some arbitrary values and I need an index to them, I would I would write something like that. And it would sift them together and stop when whenever there's no more in there. But with the coming of DHC uh, seven Point ten point two. Isn't that? Yeah, that's the latest one. Uh, GHC JS is actually just working out of the box, so you don't have to. You, you, it's easy to compile and install because I remember when I tried GHC JS uh, originally, it was really a hassle to get started on this stuff. But if you are getting Haskell. Use sandboxes, uh, look that up, um, do everything in sandboxes that will uh, save you from a lot of pain. Then you are able to get up and running with GHCJS really easy. Um, and also, um, upcoming versions, as I mentioned, like a lot of stuff is going on in there, this area. So one thing I'm really missing is the, inter the REPL for Haskell, as you can see. On the back end, I can kind of query what I'm doing. It's easier for me to poke around seeing what is this thing, what is that thing, and being able to create that thing. I can't do that on the client side yet. But Lude has an experimental version of of getting the Rebel to work in GHCJS as well uh, that I'm really looking forward to getting. So that this is if there are any uh, Lisp fans and Clojure, they would they know that this is nice. Um, Also, what about the future? Um, like, right, as I mentioned, the code side could be pretty big. Have, has anybody heard about WebAssembly? Yeah. So, so it's easier to for external lang use other host languages to target the browser. Um, this is like get started today, right? Use Elm, use PureScript, use Haskell. Uh, you will be getting your money's worth back in the future. 
the REPL, as I mentioned, and that's getting even better support, uh, support for DHCJS. So there's a thing called uh, cable, which is uh, not even, I'm not sure what I should call cable. It's not a package manager. Um, you, you, can, you can get packages and you can build. Uh, it's a combination of make and a package manager. I think that's fair to say. And also source maps is on the roadmap because the output right now from Haskell is not. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh. hmm. to this. browser can't even handle it. Can't handle Haskell. Source maps are only useful when you have runtime errors, right? <laughs> <laughs> Huh? Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's the smallest JHC JS? Like if you do a hello world, how much code gets generated? Oh, I can't remember. It's depending on you running it. Is that through the closure compiler? <laughs> So, so, like, I really feel that when I started looking at Haskell, it was very unapproachable, but it's getting better and better and better, and a lot of great things are getting fixed. So, how familiar with Haskell is people? Like, not at all. See me heard about it? Okay. There, there's this triad of things: the functor, the applicative, and the uh, monad. But in a recent version of DHC as well. Uh, now, functor is actually a superclass of applicative, and applicative is a superclass of monad. Um, historic, for historic reasons, they weren't before because the monad was implemented before. So, a really, really nice thing about this is that everything that I do, I struggled a lot in order to find like where, where should I go from here. But the fact that you're based on solid research foundations is really powerful, right? You get really good things whenever they discover them because they actually go about using them. We have ignored the a lot of the computer science done for many, many years. Like a lot of these ideas are 30 to 40 years old and they are first coming out now. And the fact that you're using something that is based on something that is discovered rather than invented is really, really great, I think. So but by saying that right, um, if you look at uh, have can we do that? Yeah, we can. So, right, all of these languages uh, are based on Lambda calculus as a foundation, and then there's some other stuff around them. But it has a really solid foundation to build on top of. And also, like, if Sharp, from my point of view, when looking for other stuff, like, I, I think that's a, a decent language. It's uh, using um, similar type systems as Haskell, uh, Milner types, and they're also both using. Uh, so, if a takeaway, if nothing else, is like focus, learn this stuff, it's useful. So start with this, learn functions as values, passing values around. Then when you get the hang of that, then add something on top of that. And be in a domain where you can actually follow where stuff is going on. <laughs> yeah, sure. But um, come ask me, like this is, it's really hard. I don't. I've been staring at it for so long that it makes sense to me. It might not make sense to anybody else. So please, er, like, ask if you want to get help, get DHC up and running, and stuff like that. Just say it too. 
How long it was a learning curve? What was your previous background and was your learning curve to get to comfortable level master? Um, I'm part of the group that wants to learn everything, so I read a lot and do not enough practice. And that's actually why I mentioned the piano quote, because it tends like it would correspond to me looking at a lot of note sheets and not actually playing the piano. That's pointless. But the fact that you have to balance this, like look at it, try it out, look at it, try it out. Uh, I spent, I've been in this for one and a half years, but as I mentioned, things are getting better and more approachable. And also the fact that get, like get mentoring, that's really, really useful. Figuring something out for yourself is super hard, but if you play and you have something, uh, someone you can ask, then you leapfrog ahead. Like a lot of the stuff that seems to make no sense, if you sit and pair program with one who actually knows it, you just learn so much very, very quickly. Because a, like a Haskell seem weird, but it's actually based on some very explicit rules. Like everything is Haskell, it's very explicit. That's by design. And because of that, it makes sense, even though we seem that it doesn't make sense right now. It's because we have to learn it. We have to study it for it to make sense. Um, if as, uh, actually, um, a, a, a comment on that is um, whenever we learn something new or we try to learn something new, we are presented with the final product of some idea, right? So if I present DNA to you, I expect you to see a cat, but of course you won't get to that conclusion. It's too abstract. But if you see the path to why we have this idea, then it starts to make a lot more sense. I hope that's helpful. Um, yeah, trying out it's all about that, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and it doesn't actually even have to be in a commercial project or you know, a real project, a side project or anything, because it affects the way you use the language that you do use in order to do the job that you do. That's an excellent point. Like the that's why I like choose something with this foundation, and I promise you that it will be useful in other stuff that you do. Right? You have often heard. <laughs> Sorry to say, like an older generation say, learn Lisp, it will help you. It's like, why should I do that? But it actually do make sense. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, we're not going to talk about it because we need, we're running out of time. Um, but if you need the other uh, trip or pizza or beer, uh, send in your next step. Thank you. Which side is your slave right. point? Is an HDMI? Uh, it's just uh, not hanging from here. That's it. Uh, you can have HDMI as well. Uh, in fact, let me get you an HDMI. Uh, can I get really quickly your emails because I need to send you a hangout link where you should be able to connect? Oh, okay. So you can share your slides. Is that Gmail? Okay, cool. Okay, cool. <laughs>
Yeah, it's from the bottom. Yeah, okay. And uh, just enter the screen. Great, okay, also thanks. Hi, my name is Sunny Cho. It's I'm everyone's probably tired, so I, I'll keep this brief. Um, so the title of this talk is "The Web After Tomorrow." It's based on a blog that a guy named Konsky wrote. He's the author of something called DataScript, and people who don't know what Datomic is, it's basically Datomic for JavaScript, built uh, for JavaScript. But it's not completely true because Datomic is actually three parts, and this DataScript is only one part of the Datomic. Uh, of the atomic story. So, so in his blog, he um, mainly talked about browsers are very capable these days. And when we write web applications, mostly the, the server is only processing data from database to the client. And the client does mo most of the work. So in the web of tomorrow, there, the, the, the server is very thin. The main thing it will do is authenticate and authorize uh, access to a database. Um, so there is no server in the web of tomorrow. The browser and JavaScript is very capable. Um, and based on this blog, the current project I'm working on tries to implement this idea. Let's, um, let's go to this. If you get a chance, you should uh, just read. It's a short re a read. So this is the old way. The browser talks to a server, the server talks to a storage, and it proxies back data. Um, it's kind of tedious. You're just pushing data back and forth between the, the, the database and the browser. What if the browser talks directly to the data storage? And uh, that's what um, the project I'm working on is implementing. It's com implemented in. Uh, just the back end is in using Clojure, front end Clojure script, and the database we're using is Datomic. And the way we keep them in sync is basically this diagram down here. So we have, actually, where is it? Here we go. So this is the client side. We have DataScript, which is Datomic for the web browser. And we have Datomic. Datomic sends data to the server to DataScript and DataScript transact it. If there are any local changes, we push it back. Um, and ClojureScript uh, takes the data and present it in the UI. So let's uh, show an example. And I'm using MySQL, but the atomic is um, interesting. It, it's three parts. It's the data store, which can be anything. It can be a SQL server. It can be a, a file system. It can be in memory. It can even be something like DynamoDB uh, for its data storage. Then there's the other side is the transactor, um, which is responsible for writing. And then there's the query engine. Normally, in other databases, they're in one server, but the atomic splits it out. Uh, what's interesting about the query engine, the query engine is actually inside of your app. It's embedded inside the data that you're working with. It's local to your app. It pulls data from the data store and lazily. And you, when you run queries, it's actually running within your uh, within your your app's namespace. So FigWheel is uh, a tool that I really like. Whenever you make change, it gives you a REPL. When you make change, it pushes automatically to, to the browser. There's no need to reload. It's compiling. Okay. 
Actually, I may have the wrong branch. not ready yet. Okay, let's clear this data. So the data in Datomic that's pushed down, we save it into uh, IndexedDB. Let's clear that. So here, you see the server sending chunks of datums to the client, the browser. Now we have the complete database um, on the client. You know, searching, uh, it's super fast. You can say, um, actually, data is not still loading. Okay, it's pretty loaded now. You can say, say um, Mary Saint. The art, the, the art dealer we're working with is specialized in a lot of religious and Spanish art. Um, say, virgin. The whole yeah, the whole database. So this will blow up. The solution we have will blow up eventually as data grows larger. What we really want to do is write a datomic peer uh, in, in, in JavaScript. We That's very, very hard. We haven't been able to do that yet. Um, so in this web of tomorrow, You want to be able to do, do something like this. You can query the uh, whole database directly, but um, you also want to subscribe to changes. This is what we, we haven't done yet. So our solution is because the data is relatively small now, it's a, a clean room project, a green room, greenfield project. We pull all the database down and we can query uh, using data log the whole database. But in the, in the future, what we want to do is we want to subscribe to changes. Um, be able to intelligently know wh which part of the data that we need to, basically a datomic peer um, in so JavaScript. You can still be querying the database to say this is the data I'm interested in. Yeah. Like rethink DB, but it's still sort of thing. Like exactly. Actually, he mentioned, so he mentions a rethink DP and be in this. So, yeah. So, you're not pushing your whole database to the client. Yeah, yeah. So, right now, we are pushing the whole database, but this solution will, will well, blow yeah. up. Yeah. Um, so, the way over is to intelligently know which to pull, which data to pull and which not to 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 pull, and that is a it's a hard problem to solve, and we're going to solve it later. Um, so that's that's basically it. Um, that's what we have so far. The whole database is queried. So some of the challenges we had. Let's see. Um, so synchronizing, yeah. Doing this uh, synchronization between uh, data log, uh, datomic and data script, this, the transaction can come out of, out of order. So we have to make sure that a transaction is played in order because um, we're getting the transaction through uh, uh, web sockets and things can come asynchronously. It's possible to get one um, a transaction to happen later. And we already have a um, yeah, transaction out of order, so we have to make sure that uh, the transaction uh, comes in order. Um, what else? What are the challenges? And performance on mobile was actually, we first developed on the desktop and we tested on mobile, it was unusable. It took like one minute to, uh, to, for the database to start up, from what, even on a local, uh, local network. Um, the reason why is because we're chunking the whole, sending the whole database down. So we had to actually break that database into smaller chunks and reassemble it. Um, and another problem is storing stuff in IndexedDB. Um, IndexedDB allows us to store binary data in, in its raw form, but to read it back, we, you can't. You just have a binary. You have to have some reader to read it back. Uh, so we didn't know how to reconstruct. I didn't know how to reconstruct that uh, the, the raw data we had. So what we, the solution was to save as strings. At first, I tried to use JSON 
using um, taking our, da our, our data and just doing JSON stringify. But the data was too big. It, it just blew up. So I had to chunk that further. Um, then the problem was um, Eden is the data structure that I, I'm serializing to, saving to. Uh, it was just too slow to read to read an Eden data structure into in, 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 in closure script was actually uh, slow. So we had to use something called transit. Um, transit is based uh, la layers on top of a JSON. It uses, it uses JSON, but it, um, it takes all anything you can serialize with Eden, you can now uh, use JSON. And it's much faster to write and much faster to, to, to read from. And if you don't know what, um, I didn't explain what Eden is. Eden is based on closures um, version of S expressions. And S expressions are nothing more than open and closed tags. So XML is considered, would be considered an S expression. Some people call XML as a poor man's S expressions. JSON is a form of S expressions. Um, and closure itself, the syntax, is it's written in Eden. But it, uh, any other challenges? Yeah, basically performance. We had to uh, um, really perform. What's, what's the, Sorry? What's, what's the sort of, what's the pros of this approach other than that you don't have the kind of server layer in between? Is the idea that you'd eventually get more performance from having it on the client once the data's on the Yeah, you can do it offline, right? You can offline storage. You, the performance is, it's, it feels like a desktop search. It just pops up. There's no latency at all. Um, but I mean, how is that different from doing like a simple web controller over like so like a Spark and Babel and then searching anyway like the actual? Well, if you have all your data local, you probably have the same performance. But then um, offline usage, with uh, using the da uh, data script, we have. If you edit it locally, you can. It's almost like um, merging. You can you can easily merge with the server. If when you go offline, you have the latest transaction. And you can actually resolve. Um, you can replay the transaction. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your questions. What advantage? Synchronizing, synchronizing the server. Write, can write easily. Well. Yeah, can write and read. Well, I, I guess the question I'm asking is that theoretically, I can see like this model has a lot of advantage for the future. But this company, Colin Cortez, obviously wants to achieve like uh, end result. What problem are you actually solving? With this so the the one of the stakeholder travels a lot. He travels internationally. So he might go to some place and he needs to build an artwork or a contact, and he has no network, right? So he needs to be able to get his, uh, be able to work with our network, uh, too. So being being offline is an important uh, feature that that needs to be done. Um, yeah. Okay. What else? So closure script is often said to be C in a oh, list in C's clothing. It's a quote from here. And um, so the foundation, uh, it borrows JavaScript. <coughs> no, sorry, JavaScript is list and C slowly. It borrows a lot of ideas from list. A lot, a lot of languages do. Um, so what are the philosophy of list? Everything is data, even code. And I think that's one of the reasons I like, I, I like list a lot. Um, programming list boils down to um, manipulating and transforming data structure. And, and, and Haskell is all about types. But in, in, in Lisp, it's basically manipulating data. Um, and because everything is data, even the AST, the abstract syntax tree, is exposed to you as, as a data structure. And that's why it's so easy to write um, AST transformation or, or code templates. They're, they're called macros. Um, no other language, I think, has um, that power of being able to manipulate the, the AST tree. You can do that, but uh, like in, in Java, they use annotation. But when you do that, you're basically manipulating strings. Um, in, in Groovy, you can do that too. Again, you manipulate strings. They're builders. Uh, but it isn't as powerful as having the AST exposed to you as a data structure. Um, so Lisp is really good at uh, creating domain-specific language, basically because, simply because you can manipulate um, the language as though it's, it's data. Yeah. Um, so here's another um, closure script, and React works really well. And uh, there's 
several different libraries out there to uh, closed script library to work with uh, React. But the one I like to use is called Reagent, and um, let's give you a demo for that. So here we have a function called a world, which translates into like a React component. And the way you write HTML is you construct data structure. This is a list. Is it too? Can you guys see that? It's too small. Get that. This is a list data structure. Uh, it's it's a vector. It has an element h1. The first element is h1. This is another. This abstract uh, the key text from this app state. And here we're we're constructing another data structure. We're looping through, or we're not looping. This is a for comprehension. We're generating a sequence. Uh, we take a range of max, which is 10, and we're the end result of this is generating HTML. And there's a function called render component. We render this hello world component onto this DOM element. And um, this is what you see here. Um, where's my pig wheel? When you modify the state of um, an atom here, it reacts automatically. Um, that's the advantage of um, what reagent does for us. It, there, it adds a watcher to this atom. And when the atom changes, it automatically re-renders the UI. So let's change the, this atom to, say, 20. Reset that to 20. Oops, that didn't render. space. From the wrong project. For some reason, my list isn't being generated. Oh, sorry. Uh, the problem is Max is already being defined somewhere. Still not being generated.
It's very strange. Oh, it's because I is a number, not a string. And the reagent doesn't like that. You've got to string what I. Really? Yeah, if you write that in square. <coughs> No. Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. Cool, yeah, so now, now it's working. Now we can... Um, in the wrapper. We can reset x num to say Okay. Just on Maxi React uh, to it. Um, yeah, so it, working with um, React JS in Reagent is really um, easy. It, you just compose functions, and your function just generate um, HTML. You put, you change the data. The whole components react to the to the new data change. And um, it's because reagent has a watcher on these atoms. Every time the atoms is is this change, it invokes the uh, the component to redraw. Um, that's about it. I have gonna another thing that I like about uh, Closure Script is Query Sync. Um, Query Sync is it implements a uh, It implements uh, CSP, concurrent uh, sequential processing. It's the same concept as Go. So Google invented a whole language called Go to do CSP. And we have this in, 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 in Clojure, Enclosure script, simply as a library. Um, so what is, what is CSP? CSP is trying to do concurrency. Um, concurrency in parallel, the quote here, uh, when I look, look, looked it up, Concurrency and parallelism is not the same. With concurrency, you're trying to do um, you're trying to do a lot of things at the same time. But with parallelism, you try to do a lot of things, um, a lot of things. Um, concurrency is about taking tasks and doing and doing overlaying them. But parallelism is doing at the same time. I'm not explaining it right, but one useful feature of this is taking, especially in closure script programming, is taking events from uh, the dome and converting to a stream of data, which you can you can process. Um, or um, when you're doing a lot of async stuff, which is what you uh, what you do in, in uh, even Node.js or JavaScript, everything is async. And when you have a lot of async code, it's very hard to reason about. With query sync, you can actually take these async code and order it, write it as though they were um, synchronous code. And that's easier to reason with. Um, let's, I have some code example. Let's see. So IndexedDB is all asynchronous. When you add or read from IndexedDB, you're basically doing a callback. Um, but I want to expose two um, code that's asynchronous. So these are the two functions you really need for, uh, for, for a, va a key value store. You want to put data, and you want to read data. And you want to write in a way that it's synchronous. So how's that done? Um, first, when you request uh, in, uh, an index DB, when you want to have access to the index DB object, you call this function. But since it's all asynchronous, you first you have to create a request. When you get a request, 
you have to put a callback a success, on a success uh, callback. And when the success callback is uh, ran, then you have the index CB. But instead of returning that, this whole function returns what, a, what is a channel. So you create a channel and you return the channel. When there is data through callback, you put data into the channel. Now let's go back to put. When you call a put, you want to first request an index DB. But you don't get the index DB back. You get a channel to an index DB. Then you read from the channel. There's a go block. So in this go block, the go block returns immediately. Um, but within this go block, you're guaranteed to be sequential. Every, any, everything in this go block will execute sequentially. Um, so the first thing it does is it's going to read from this index DB channel. When the, when a channel is ready, when it has data, you read off of it, you have an index DB. Then it continues on to do all this other stuff. And um, request a put. Next, a get. Um, So in a put, I don't really care. I only care that there's an error. I just print out an error, there's an error. But I just, I, I don't want to get anything back from a put. What we get, I do want to get something back. So I create another channel. This go block returns immediately, and I get a channel back. But in this go block, it's guaranteed to run sequentially. I get the index DB channel. I wait for the channels who have data. Um, I do something to it. I, 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 I go do a request on the data store. And when the data store is successful, it, it can get the data. It executes this on success handler. When this on handler is executed, it puts that value onto the channel. So now I can I can read read distinctly. That's why um here's the code to do this. It's called the So again, without query sync, this I would have um, what's callback people call it callback hell. So here, this piece of go, block here runs asynchronously. So I get the data, and this it, it runs uh, synchronously. And notice I have to be in the go block. Without the go block, it would not work. I can't execute this function without the go block. So that's about it. Any any questions about this? Is that similar to like async await, but coming in the S7, like you can await a value of what synchronous Yeah, I mean, underneath is it's all doing callbacks. It what it does is it turns this into callbacks. There's um see that can go a while loop. Yeah, that's kind of syntactic should go over there. Promises, which are like one, one shot channels, and these are like multi shot channels. Yeah. Yeah. Another cool, uh, here, here's a piece of code that looks kind of dangerous. So you loop forever in this go block, you loop forever. It seems like it's, it doesn't stop. But what happens is go is actually a macro. It takes this and transforms it to a form that is, not, is actually not an infinite loop. The scroll block returns immediately, but what's inside uh, seems like it's loop, looping forever. Uh, but it's actually not. Um, another thing about query sync is you can take multiple channels, you can merge them together, and you can filter uh, across those, those channels. And you can't do that very, you can do that easily with plain old JavaScript. Um, so, any other questions? Well, kind of yeah, yeah, you, stre you stream them, yeah. You can, there's also, you can pipe them, uh, merge them. Yeah, lots of 
would have, sorry? The stream errors. The stream errors. So stuff. You, you can put errors to the channel just to say. Yeah, yeah. Data. You, it's just data. Yeah. It's just, it just puts data in there. It's not really, um, it's not, there's no real socket connection. It's just, just data structures underneath. Any questions? I know it's, everyone's tired. Probably want to leave. So, okay, that's about it. Thank you. You can ask me questions. That stuff um, around the atomic sure. is stunning, right? Yeah. Um, Google, uh, oh, go on to YouTube and watch Rich Hickey's talk about the atomic, which is so that now is a lot long. You just do Rich Hickey's the atomic. Um, best hour and a half, you'll have the same. July 20. And I'm awesome, so I think we're doing it again. Um, right, thank you very much. So if anybody wants to do a talk, we've got some, I think we're trying to get a special speaker lined up next month, next month, but um, I'm Jeff Burks. Very exciting. Um, but yeah, if anyone wants to do a talk, then please do see Amy. Um, thank you much for coming. Have some more up here, have some more burgers. And drink. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.